Julie Barnett of London, welcoming you for the second time to my living room. And just to give you a reminder of the layout of the room, um, so you can see the colours, the feel, um, the height, the size, um, and so on. And I've chosen this particular hour, late afternoon, early evening, because the light is especially good at this time. And light is going to be important today because I'm going to show you um, a few paintings um, around the place. The other difference between today and the first time I took you to this room, and in future times we might be going to the dining room and the study and other places, but for now we're staying in this room. Um, the other reason I took you here today is because there's a theme, unlike last time. Last time there was a few random objects. Today is a theme. And I jotted down three words which really encapsulated that theme. Disguise. Deceit. And guile. That is the theme and the common factors in the objects I'm going to show you today. So let's start off with this object right in the corner. It is, as you can see, a black ebony frame surrounding a little bronze relief. The bronze is that of Oliver Cromwell who was Lord Protector of England, 1649 to 1660. The only time this country has been a republic, um, and the only time we haven't had a monarch. Charles I, of course, had been beheaded, January the 30th, 1649. And you might have already seen the tour I give around the wreaths to commemorate the martyrdom of Charles I, and those little streets connected with that. That's for another time if you haven't already seen it. Why do I link this with disguise and with deceit? Well, it's because the frame is actually considerably older than the actual bronze relief. The frame dates from around about 1590, 1610, yet the actual uh, relief is, as I mentioned to you, 1649. You have to think about the historical context here. Um, the royalists had lost any, any relationship and any um, open um, association with the old regime would have been frowned upon and people would not wish to have done that. So people would have wanted to proclaim themselves to be loyal to the new regime, Oliver Cromwell and the Roundheads. So whoever had owned this frame had almost certainly had a little miniature of somebody else in it. I would suspect the king. And now that there were there was a new set of people in town running the show, whoever owned that frame frame hurriedly took the picture of the king out and put in a picture of the new ruler, as if to say, oh no, 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 I was never a royalist, I'm always in favour of the Roundheads and um, uh, Oliver Cromwell. It's a great example of a social comment of what was going on at that time, and how people were using things in their home as a way, really, um, to um, uh, really mislead those that were seeing the things in their homes. Now on to some paintings. And I want to draw your attention to this one, high up on the wall here. This painting is by uh, Leopold Pascal. Leopold Pascal um, was um, the official artist for the French Free Army during the period of the Second World War, when Charles de Gaulle um, and all of his um, accomplices, if I can call them that, had left France and were in England, living in exile, in and around Pimlico, and Chelsea area, and indeed the French army was based in Dolphin Square, Pimlico, down in Westminster. Now, um, Leopold Pascal was appointed the artist, the official artist, and indeed that's what he did. When the war ended, most of the French returned to France, but Leopold Pascal remained here with his lifetime lover, Lucette de la Billière. Pascal lived to the 1970s and eventually died in London. Lucette de la Billière lived all the way through to a ripe old age to the beginning, early years of the 21st century. Why have I selected this? Well, firstly, it's absolutely of its time. Just look at this. Um, this is Pascal's rendition of his lover, Lucette, and you can see there that red lipstick, um, that zip coat, that red polo neck, the hairstyle's the real giveaway. This is absolutely of its time from the 1950s. But what interested me about this, when I first saw this in Lucette de la Billière's studio, after she died, everything was coming up for auction, and if ever you wanted an image of 
um, a bohemian artist lair, then Lucette de la Billière's place in an attic in Chelsea was the place, ram-packed, full of bottles and drinks and paints and books. It was the bohemian den if there ever was one. She was the artist's artist. And I managed to get this, um, this portrait of her by her longtime lover. But they had a second existence. And it wasn't the existence of artists, it was the existence of spies. Because throughout their lives, where they seemed to live this chaotic life, they actually lived a very, very, very useful and structured and targeted life, being constant informants to the French government in exile and then the French government afterwards over what was going on in the inner sanctums of this country and of the, the elites within this country. It's a great example of a double life. And talking of a double life, let me show you this. It's an oil on board. And the oil on board is painted by Edwin Ellis. Ellis was a Victorian painter. I'm going to bring it down so you can really see a close-up about him. Um, and what has just fallen out, particularly um, handily, is a description of this piece. First, let me show you the back of this. You can see that this painting um, has been sold many times over. The chalk marks and so on. This is Christie's. Um, it's been auctioned in Christie's and there's also other pieces of writing when it has passed through sale houses. But what I want to draw your attention to is this little piece of paper because the piece of paper describes the piece of art. I'm just going to read a little bit of it to you. This painting I bought, whoever I is, I have no idea, um, brought away with me. Um, the seascape is by Edwin Ellis. Edwin Ellis was quite a noted painter of marine subjects, born in Nottingham, 1841, died in 1895. He was a member of the Royal Society of British Artists, and between 1865 and 91 exhibited no less than 145 pictures in public exhibitions in 85 galleries all over the country. Why have I selected this? What has this got to do with the double life that I mentioned? Well, I will explain. I purchased this from a convent. The convent was closing down and everything within that convent was up for sale. I arrived at around 10 o'clock in the morning. By then, the antiques trade had passed through the entire place like a plague of locusts. Anything of value or of interest or of beauty had disappeared. I saw one thing up on the wall of the Mother Superior and it was this painting. And I said, not to the Mother Superior, but to another nun, that's a rather nice oil. Is that for sale? She said, oh, no, 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 that's not for sale. Um, these are Mother Superior's private possessions. I said, all right. So I just carried on wandering around. And as I was about to leave, I saw what was clearly the Mother Superior arriving. She meandered down the corridor and I accosted her in a most polite of ways, of course. And I said to her, um, Reverend Mother, um, there's a lovely painting in your study. I wondered if it was for sale because everything else seems to have been sold. She said, come with me, show me. Went to her study, saw this, pointed to it. She said, yes, I'll sell that. I said, how much? She said, well, how much would you like to pay? I said, how much would you like to ask? She said, um, 30 pounds. I said, that will be most agreeable. And I gave her the cash and left with it. To cut a long story short, over a period of many years, I remained in contact with the Reverend Mother. And it turned out that despite her being a wonderful and beloved Mother Superior, she was also a canny collector. Not canny financially, but canny in having a wonderful eye for spotting fine pieces of art. This nun, in a lifetime of wearing habits and holy habits and clothes and her dedication to the life of her convent, she had also been collecting and collecting and collecting wonderful things. And this was one of them that she parted with. It was really, in the most delightful sense of the word, a double life that she'd been leading. And talking of double lives, let me show you this beauty. This is a man, obviously. I would call him an Orientalist explorer. I know nothing about who he is at the moment, although I am doing some research. Um, it is painted on a piece of board and the board has German on the back. And it seems to be from Germany at the time, painted between 1890 and 1910. I've taken it to the National Portrait Gallery. I've shown it to various experts of Orientalists at that time. It seems to be a German traveler traveling in disguise somewhere. 
I bought it because I just loved it. It's probably my favourite portrait. It is so sympathetic. His face is so beautiful. I know nothing more about the painter or about the sitter. Maybe it's a self-portrait, I don't know. But it certainly seems to be somebody in disguise, ready to descend into another world, in the robes of that other world, but to descend with sympathy and to descend with a gentleness that I really found quite compelling. Gentleness is not something what I associate, I would associate with this man. This is the greatest merchant of disguise of all time. Captain Sir Richard Francis Burton, Orientalist, explorer, linguist, spoke 27 languages. It's not such a fine portrait. That's not why I bought this. I bought this because it is a rare contemporary painting of the man. He lived from 1821 to 1890, born in Torquay, died in Trieste, but would spend years descending into the cultures of many, many places. And in those places, he would sometimes disappear without trace and then come out years later with these incredible insights into the cultures he was in. What I loved about this is the fact that it's contemporary and the fact that he is the ultimate in deception, guile and disguise. And even in death, he was a man of, deceit is maybe too harsh a word, but certainly a man very different from what he appeared to be. Take a look at this. This is Burton's grave. Mortlake Roman Catholic Cemetery, southwest London. And you can see there that his grave um, is a Bedouin tent. Within that Bedouin tent are two coffins, those of him and his wife, lead coffins above ground. And you can see the houses behind. It's a Bedouin tent in the middle of a Roman Catholic cemetery in London. Isn't that fantastically bizarre? But it is once again not as it seems, because that tent itself um, it's not a tent, it's made out of stone, it's a mausoleum. And you can climb around the back and look down at their coffins. When he died in 1890, on the anniversary of his death every year, London society would train it from central London to Mortlake, Victoria to Mortlake, take tea within the mausoleum, within the Bedouin tent, dressed in Bedouin robes. His wife, who lived on another 14 years after his death, would put um, um, the best silver and would put linen white table linen and napery on the coffin and they would have tea there and toast to the health and the life and the death of Sir Richard Burton, the master of deception. And now over to another master of a different type. This is Emile Capon, a painting by Emile Capon. There is his name. The sunlight is just coming through the window and it is just for a few brief minutes a day when you can really catch his signature there, Capon. Emile Capon died in 1980 and he was born in 1890. And Capon painted for 75 years of his 90 year life, always in disguise. He lived in three places, Morocco, shuttling between Marrakesh and Casablanca, Chicago, and Paris. And wherever he was, he would adopt the local clothes in order to get access to and insight into the peoples that he was painting. In Paris, he painted in the main in the nudes, because in Paris society at that time, most people seemed to spend most of their time at home in the nudes. And he painted hundreds of female nudes like this. This is one of them. Um, in Morocco, he dressed as a sheikh getting into madrasas and mosques all over the country. In Chicago, he mixed with the gangsters of Al Capone and the wives of the gangsters in particular and painted many of them. Capon also was, had the pride of his collection, not as paintings, but as peacocks. He bred and he kept peacocks, thus this little tribute to him of some peacock feathers at the top. And sitting right above Emile Capon is a tile. And this tile, made in about 1910, 1920, hung on the walls of Café Riche. Café Riche is one of those legendary meeting spots of spies around the world. Café Riche is still, and was, and is, um, on the corner of Midan Talat Harb, at the top of Talat Harb Street in Cairo, and right close to Malaka Nasli Street in Cairo. And Café Riche was where the intrigue of a century and a half of spies met communists and socialists and religious and non-religious and revolutionaries and British and Germans and Italians and French and Greeks and Armenians and so on, all would meet 
in Café Riche still do to a certain extent. The incurable romantic within me, when given the possibility of owning a tile that hung on the wall of that cafe that would have seen so much coming and going, I jumped at it. I've spent, I've spent many dozens of my, hours of my life sitting in Café Riche in downtown Cairo, but to own a part of it, pretty irresistible. And the two final things. The first of them is the temple of Mendasius in Rome. Mendasius is indeed the god of deceit and deception and disguise. And the temple of Mendasius is as charming now as it is there in this 19th century watercolour. There's just one man there, a little ditch, a few bits and pieces of bags. If you go to the temple of Mendasius in Rome now, it is as off the beaten track now as it was then. You can have it all to yourself on a quiet day in Rome and just sit amongst its columns and dream about the romance of what went on in that temple. And so fitting to the theme of today, it is of course where we get the word mendacious from uh, in the English language, to deceive and to lie. And finally, we end off close to home here in Bloomsbury. Um, if ever a painting represented the Bloomsbury set, that extraordinary and exotic and outrageous and bizarre group of people. Um, Virginia Woolf, John Maynard Keynes, Strachey, Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and many others. The outer parts of the circle, the inner parts of the circle, the hangers-on, those that join them later. These remarkable, creative, outrageous people, if anything represented them, this is the area where I live, it is this painting. Now, I have no idea who painted this painting. I have no evidence what I'm about to say, but it just fits in really well. Let me say something about this. Look at that man there. There he is, mustachioed, pale-skinned. He looks like a sergeant major in the British Army or even an officer in the British Army. Um, and there he is, standing while the camp, in robed up, um, in medals and peacock feathers and ribbons and belts and sashes and so on. It looks as if he's dressed up in whatever it is, Arabic or Persian or, or whatever where it is. It's a real strange concoction. But he's ready to go out partying with the Bloomsbury set. Once again, he is not his normal person. He is robed up and in disguise. And I thought it was a great way to end this. And the best way to end today would be to dedicate these last few minutes to two things. Firstly, to that Bloomsbury set. It is often said that they lived in squares, mixed in circles, and loved in triangles. And I thought to myself, what a fantastic way to live. That's my first tribute. But my second tribute, but with my own little disguise on, um, is a tribute to you, the listener, who has tuned in again to watch me give this little tour of my home. Um, and so, to you, the listener, I will raise my glass and say to you, as I've said in previous times, thank you for coming and I wish you all the best. Cheers. <laughs>